All right, everyone, welcome back to the land of Chem. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. This is episode nine, an introduction to the function of the Great Pyramid. I am extremely excited about today's video. Of course, there's a ton of information to cover in regard to the function of the Great Pyramid. In today's video, I will be presenting some of the anomalous details of the Giza Plateau and will provide a brief introduction to the configuration of the Great Pyramid so that when we get to discussing the function of the structure, you'll already be familiar with its internal configuration and some of the unusual details about the structure itself. So without further ado, let's get right to it. And just a quick reminder that limited first edition print copies of The Land of Chem are now available at www.thelandofchem.com. I also have the second degree t-shirts now available. The logo featured on the t-shirts is a 45, 45, 90 degree triangle, which represents the red pyramid and the molecules inside the structure are symbolic of the chemical that was being produced inside that pyramid. So again, if you're interested, www.thelandofchem.com. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the Land of Chem YouTube channel, like this video, share it with your friends and help me get this material out there. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. All right, the topic for today's video, the function of the Great Pyramid. I will begin by introducing the internal configuration of the structure, and then I will proceed with a tour around the Giza Plateau so that I can present some of the anomalous details that are located on the plateau surrounding these three pyramids. Here's a great diagram of the Great Pyramid that shows in detail the exterior and interior components of this structure. So in the previous picture, we were right here on the northern face of the Great Pyramid. And as you move around to the east, you can see the causeway leading from the Nile River up to the structure. The causeway led directly into the pyramid's eastern temple, which was connected into the enclosure wall surrounding the pyramid. Now within the narrative of the land of Chem, I propose that these enclosure walls were in fact reservoirs. And these reservoirs were used to house water that was utilized within the pyramids to facilitate chemical reactions. So you'll see these reservoir walls surrounding all of the pyramids, starting with the step pyramid complex, moving to the red and bent pyramids of Dashur, and then of course here with the three pyramids on the Giza Plateau, they are all surrounded with a reservoir wall. Now moving to the inner components of the Great Pyramid, we'll start here with the northern descending shaft. This descending shaft leads into the subterranean chamber. And the subterranean chamber is connected to the interior components of the Great Pyramid via the well shaft. Now, at this point in the discussion, I'm going to utilize the pharaonic titles of these chambers. Within the book, I do use a much more chemical engineering based technical description for these chambers, but at this point, we're just gonna introduce these chambers so that you can be more familiar with the interior configuration. So again, you have here the Grand Gallery, which is the largest chamber in the Great Pyramid. You have here in the center of the structure, what's called your Queen's Chamber. And then you have here at the top, the King's Chamber or the primary reaction chamber within the Great Pyramid. And you will notice these air shafts leading out to the exterior of the structure. Those were in fact air shafts. They do serve multiple purposes and we'll get to that a bit later in the video, but this will at least give you a quick introduction to the exterior and interior configuration of the Great Pyramid. As you begin to explore the Giza Plateau, you will immediately recognize the interlocking polygonal masonry that was utilized in the pyramid's construction. So something to keep in mind when assessing the construction of the Egyptian pyramids the structure that you see above ground is only half of what has been accomplished. There was a massive project of terrain and landscape engineering that went into designing and building the foundation upon which these massive structures could sit. There was absolutely nothing haphazard about the construction of the Egyptian pyramids and every single one of the millions and millions of blocks that went into building these structures was meticulously engineered and placed. Again, none of this stuff happened by accident, and it is absolutely mind-blowing to try to comprehend the entire scope of work that went into designing these structures. So what you see above ground is only half of what has been accomplished. It's very important to remember everything that lies below 
and the foundation of the Giza Plateau. Here's a really cool picture from the far eastern side of the Giza Plateau, which shows that portions of this area have been built up with man-made construction. So that's just something to remember that the Giza Plateau is not a 100% natural structure, but again, there has been massive amounts of terrain and landscape engineering that went into establishing the foundation for these pyramids. Here's another great picture of this same area so that you can really see the man-made construction that has been utilized to build up this portion of the Giza Plateau. And just a quick shout out to Professor Muhammad and our friend and guide in Egypt, Yusuf Awiyan. Miss you, brother, and I can't wait to see you again soon. And here we are back up close in person next to the Great Pyramid. And this is the structure's northeastern corner. And this corner of the pyramid is actually a portion of the Giza Plateau. So what better way to provide stability for your everlasting pyramid than to integrate a portion of its foundation with the earth? And that is exactly what you see here in the construction of the Great Pyramid. In the next series of slides, I will be discussing the temple located on the eastern side of the Great Pyramid. And at this point, I'd like to introduce the geology that was utilized in the construction of the Egyptian pyramids and the adjacent sites and temples located across Egypt. So predominantly, you will find the utilization of white limestone, red granite, and black basalt. And these three types of stones have very, very different chemical compositions and physical properties. And these three materials were selected very intentionally for the construction of specific components located within these structures. I won't get into that at this point. I will mention that I just stumbled across some very compelling information about one of the physical properties of black basalt that will be incorporated in the second book of the Land of Chem series. But again, I just wanted to introduce these very briefly so that you're familiar with these materials when it comes up in our future discussions, because it will be very relevant here soon. And here are some awesome pictures of that black basalt foundation of the Great Pyramid's Eastern Temple. And I don't know why, but this area of the structure is extremely compelling to me. And there is a very unusual sensation that you get when you're walking around these stones. It's a very, very surreal experience to be around this side of the Great Pyramid. But again, I just wanted to introduce this portion of the structure. I feel like it's kind of one of those neglected areas that doesn't get discussed very much but it will be very relevant in our discussions here soon. So again, pictures of that black basalt foundation stones all along the eastern portion of the Great Pyramid. And you can see here the remnants of the red granite obelisks that were once in place in this eastern temple. This is an awesome bird's eye view of the Great Pyramid's Eastern Temple. And you can very quickly see in this picture all of the components that I've previously discussed. So you have the black basalt foundation of that Eastern Temple. You'll see here the red granite remains of the obelisks that surrounded the corners of this temple. A couple other components that I'll mention very briefly. You will see here behind the Eastern Temple, directly at the base of the Great Pyramid, there is a massive well shaft that leads here into the foundation of the Giza Plateau. And you'll also notice these conduits that run around the outside of the Eastern Temple. And I will discuss both of these components in the subsequent slides. This is a picture of a large conduit that has been carved into the limestone foundation of the Giza Plateau. And it runs around the outside of the Great Pyramid's Eastern Temple. Now the archeologist on site, this gentleman here in the green sweater, explained to us that this conduit was carved during the modern day to house the cabling for the sound and light show. So every night at the Giza Plateau, they shine pictures and play music and shine lights on the Great Pyramid. And it's this big production. And again, the explanation was that this conduit was carved to house the cabling for this light production. Let's just say I was extremely dubious of this explanation because there is sound and light cabling running all across the Giza Plateau, and not one single bit of it is placed into this conduit. But again, that is an explanation that we were given. So again, this is a modern conduit on the Giza Plateau. However, there are plenty of ancient conduits. So that previous picture was of a modern conduit that runs around the outside of the Great Pyramid's Eastern Temple. 
In this picture, you can see the ancient conduits that originally ran along the outside of the Great Pyramid. And we did confirm with the archaeologists on site that these are indeed ancient conduits that were built during the construction of the Great Pyramid. Now, these conduits are carved into the limestone foundation of the Giza Plateau, and the conduits run underneath the black basalt flooring of the Great Pyramid's Eastern Temple. And these conduits are not located exclusively around the Great Pyramid. These conduits are found all across the Giza Plateau and all around the pyramids and ancient sites of Egypt. So the conduits running across the Giza Plateau and underneath the black basalt flooring of the Great Pyramid's Eastern Temple are one anomalous detail of the Giza Plateau that are often neglected in the discussion of the function of these structures. One other anomalous detail of the Giza Plateau that I'd like to present are these ruts covering the area that were originally filled with deposits of iron oxide. And in these pictures, you can see some close-ups of these ruts on the northern and eastern side of the Great Pyramid. And I do believe that these ruts were originally filled with deposits of iron oxide. And my justification for that belief is there are deposits in some of these ruts that still exist today. So you can see here in this picture, the reddish brown material filling in these ruts on the eastern side of the Great Pyramid. And this is in fact iron oxide. And these deposits are all over the Giza Plateau. Now, my impression is that these deposits existed prior to the construction of these pyramids the individuals that built these structures were well aware of these deposits and they selected the Giza Plateau intentionally for the construction of these pyramids. And in the next series of pictures, we're moving from the eastern side of the Great Pyramid to the eastern side of the Central Pyramid. And you can see here another massive deposit of this iron oxide. And I do believe that the builders of the Egyptian pyramids were well aware of these deposits of iron oxide and selected this location very intentionally for the construction of the Egyptian pyramids because these deposits are not only located outside of the structures, but I actually discovered in my November 2020 research trip to Egypt that these deposits of iron oxide are actually located within the pyramids themselves. This is a diagram of the central pyramid of Giza. And in the next picture, I will show you an area inside of this pyramid that contains those deposits of iron oxide. So the next picture, I'm actually standing right here at the bottom of this upper passage, looking up into this excavated area of the central pyramid. And within this area, there are massive, massive deposits of this iron oxide within the core of the central pyramid. So again, when assessing the construction of the central pyramid, there was a massive natural mound that was utilized as a portion of the pyramid's foundation. And within this mound are found those deposits of iron oxide. So to me, this is an indication that those deposits were there prior to the construction of the Egyptian pyramids. And the builders of these structures were well aware of these iron deposits and utilize them within the foundation of the pyramids. So this is a quick excerpt from an academic publication discussing an analysis of a prehistoric Egyptian iron bead. And I wanted to present this to prove that the Egyptians absolutely had iron and had the capability of working with this metal. So in this abstract, they are analyzing an iron bead from approximately 3300 BCE. And this is very early, even in the conventional dynastic Egyptian timeline. And this shows that they were cold working iron meteorites to create jewelry and weaponry. So we also know that Tutankhamun also had an iron dagger, which was made from meteoric iron. So again, I just wanted to share this with you so that if you ever hear that the dynastic Egyptians didn't have iron or didn't know how to work with iron, you will know that that is complete nonsense. They were absolutely familiar with this metal. And this is gonna be very, very relevant in our discussions in the near future. 
All right, now we are back up close in person next to the Great Pyramid. And I just wanted to show you this massive shaft that is located here on the eastern side of the Great Pyramid. Now these shafts that have been excavated into the limestone foundation of the Giza Plateau absolutely cover the area. There are these well shafts all over the place, but I just wanted to show you a quick picture of the one that is located here, again, on the eastern side of the Great Pyramid. I feel like this is another neglected detail of the structure that doesn't get mentioned very much in the discussion of the function of these pyramids. You can see here, this is a very, very deep well shaft, again, excavated into the limestone foundation of the Giza Plateau. And this thing hasn't been fully excavated. It's filled with dirt and sand and debris, and they will probably never spend the money to see where the shift actually goes. But again, I think that these small components are integral in the discussion of the function of these structures. And in the next series of pictures, you can see the conduit system that lead from this shaft back towards and underneath the black basalt floor of the Great Pyramid's Eastern Temple. And these conduits, again, these run all across the Giza Plateau. They are not exclusive to the Great Pyramid. They're actually in all of the ancient sites in Egypt. And these are indications of moving fluids within these structures, which to me imply more of a function than is con communicated in the conventional narrative. And this is an amazing picture of the northern face of the Great Pyramid. I wanted to share this so you can get a sense of the size of the structure as you are preparing to enter into the modern entrance. So you go up this little staircase here on the northern face of the structure, and this guy in the white shirt over here is standing at the hole that has been excavated, which now serves as the modern entrance to the structure. But keep in mind that the original inlet to that northern shaft is located here. There's a white sign in this excavated portion of the northern face, and there was a team of engineers on site that were doing scanning of the subterranean chamber. So I actually got a chance to get in there and get a picture of that northern descending shaft, which I'll show in here in just a moment. But again, just keep in mind, the modern entrance to the structure is down here, and the original inlet to that northern descending shaft is up here. So this picture is inside the Great Pyramid from that excavated modern entrance. And this picture shows the gated area that leads down into that descending shaft, which takes you into the Great Pyramid subterranean chamber. As I mentioned before, there was a team of engineers doing scanning on the subterranean chamber, and these gates were up, fortunately unlocked. And I did get a chance to go down here and get some pictures of that northern shaft. Here on the left, you can see a picture of the northern shaft going up towards the daylight. And on the right, you can see the northern shaft descending into the subterranean chamber of the Great Pyramid. Again, very fortunate to get a picture of this often closed off area. So generally speaking, the subterranean and Queen's chambers of the Great Pyramid are off limits to the public. You have to pay big money to get special permission to have them unlock the gate so that you can get inside these chambers. But in the next few pictures, I'll show you what these chambers look like. And I really like these old pictures that show what these areas look like prior to the excavation. So here on the left, you'll see a picture of the subterranean chamber. This is the well shaft that goes out of the bottom of the subterranean chamber. Here is the dead end shaft that goes out to the south of the subterranean chamber. Here on the right, this photo is from inside the well shaft and the grotto. And the well shaft connects the subterranean chamber up to the inner components and the grand gallery. In this picture, this is a relatively modern picture of the subterranean chamber. Again, over here to the left side would have been that dead end shaft. Here you'll see the well shaft. And here on the right would have been the inlet of the northern descending shaft into the subterranean chamber. And the next component of the Great Pyramid that we will be discussing is the Queen's Chamber. And uh, so this actually functioned as the collection chamber for the chemical that was being produced inside the Great Pyramid. And I won't go into great detail about the function of this particular chamber, but I just want to point out a few components. So you'll see here the shaft leading into the Queen's Chamber. You'll see here this elaborate niche structure and several shafts that have been excavated. There's one leading out here towards the east, and there's also a shaft that has been covered up with modern masonry that leads out the bottom 
of this queen's chamber. But again, this is an exceptional diagram that I found of this chamber, and I'll show you some pictures of this area here. All right, so here's a picture of me and Yusuf Awian investigating the area outside of the quote unquote queen's chamber. And I just wanted to show you this so that you can see the material covering the limestone walls outside of this area within the structure. At this point, I won't go into an explanation of what this material is or what its purpose was, but I will say that it had an integral part of the function of the structure. So I just wanted to show you this. Again, this is the entrance area to the Queen's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. And here we are inside the collection chamber of the Great Pyramid. And I wanted to share this picture so that you can see the modern masonry that now covers up the extraction shaft leading out below the niche within this chamber. And there have been several shafts discovered within the Great Pyramid that are now covered up with modern masonry. So we have this one here in the collection chamber, and you also have a shaft that has now been covered up in the king's chamber. And this is probably my favorite diagram of the Great Pyramid that I found on the Wikipedia page for the Great Pyramid. And I really like this one because it indicates not only the types of stone that was utilized in the construction of the Great Pyramid, but it also shows those shafts that I mentioned in the previous slides. So you see here at the bottom of the collection chamber, there is an extraction shaft that leads out of this chamber and it has now been covered up with modern masonry. And you will see the same here in the King's Chamber that there is a shaft system leading out of this chamber. And this one also has been covered up with modern masonry. And we'll get to that here in just a moment. But you can also see on this diagram, the red granite that has been utilized in the construction of the King's Chamber, which makes this chamber extremely unique in regard to the Egyptian pyramids. And here we are inside the grand gallery of the Great Pyramid. And I'll continue to use the pharaonic titles of these chambers just for introductory purposes. And you can see in this picture, the unusual material covering the walls of this grand gallery. Again, I won't say what that material is or what its function was, but it was integral in the operation of this structure. Now, I will mention that during my first visit inside the Great Pyramid, I had the immediate impression that something was occurring within this chamber that produced an immense amount of heat. The interior of this chamber looks as if it has been baked at a very, very high temperature. Now, I didn't realize what the function of this chamber was until much later in my research, but I will say the reaction that was occurring inside this chamber was extremely exothermic. And the evidence of this high temperature reaction is still very much evident inside this chamber. All right, and we are moving from the grand gallery here at the bottom left of this diagram into the antechamber of the king's chamber. And I just wanted to point out one of the most critical components of this small chamber. So you'll see here in this next picture, the four deep grooves that were carved in the southern wall of the king's chamber antechamber. And again, these grooves were critical for allowing the passage of gases that were being produced inside the king's chamber to flow through the antechamber into the grand gallery. So I just wanted to present this component because it will be relevant in later discussions. And here we are inside the king's chamber or the furnace chamber of the Great Pyramid. And yes, I will begin to reveal the function of these individual chambers. So this picture is of the southern air shaft leading into this furnace chamber. And I wanted to show this to you so you can see the configuration of the termination of this air shaft. So the termination of the northern air shaft is a normal rectangle. And I'll show that in some subsequent slides. But the termination of the southern shaft is this very unusual oblong shape. And I believe that this was engineered very specifically because of what was delivered through this southern shaft into the furnace chamber. And in this picture, again, you can see the termination of the southern air shaft and the engineering of this component was very meticulous and intentional. You can see here that there is some curvature to the termination of this air shaft, which was utilized to deliver something into the furnace chamber.
And here's an awesome picture from inside the furnace chamber of the Great Pyramid, which shows the large red granite crucible in the western section of this chamber. And again, when I was inside this furnace chamber, I got an immediate impression that there was something extremely exothermic occurring inside this structure. And you can see here in this picture, the metal grate that now covers up the shaft system that leads out of the bottom of the king's chamber. So I just wanted to show that to you that it does indeed exist within this furnace chamber. And this may be one of my favorite pictures from inside the furnace chamber of the Great Pyramid. You can see here the large rectangular red granite crucible and the termination of the northern air shaft. And I mentioned before, there's a very big difference between the engineering of the termination of the northern air shaft when compared to the termination of the southern air shaft. And both of these shafts had two completely different functions, which again, I discussed that in the fourth degree of the land of Chem, where I give a detailed explanation of the function of the Great Pyramid. And here at the far corner of this picture, you can just see the shaft leading from the antechamber into the furnace chamber. All right, so we've reached the conclusion of today's virtual tour of the Giza Plateau, where I pointed out some anomalous details of the area that hopefully you were not previously familiar with. And we've also done a brief introduction to the configuration of the Great Pyramid, so that when I get to discussing the function of this structure, you will already be well acquainted with its interior components. And for those of you that are interested in reading the story and getting an in-depth technical explanation of exactly how all of these structures operated, the Step Pyramid, the Red Pyramid, the Bent Pyramid, the Giza Pyramids, and the ancient passage chamber structures of Ireland, visit www.thelandofchem.com and you can pick up your copy of the book today. Again, I do have limited first edition copies of the book now available. You can also pick up your Land of Chem t-shirts. Again, www.thelandofchem.com. It means the world to me. So thank you guys so much in advance. And for those of you that made it this far to the end of the video, I just wanna say thank you so much for your support of the Land of Chem. If you aren't already, please subscribe to the Land of Chem YouTube video. Like this video, share it with your friends. Help me get this material out there. I wanna share this with as many people as possible. And um, that's really the only way I know how to do it is to ask you guys to share this with your friends, like and subscribe. Uh, if you haven't already, follow me on Instagram at the land of chem and www.thelandofchem.com if you want to pick up your copy of the book. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you next time.